Right, okay. Hi, everybody. Um, let me know if you can't hear me properly or if there's any issues, but hopefully we'll be, we'll be okay. Welcome to session four of the PSA, uh, preparing for the PSA series. I'll be taking the session today. My name is Sona, for those of you who don't know me. Normally, me and Janice take the sessions, but she's on call today, so I'm going to try and man the chat as much as I can, um, but it might be the case that I'll have a look at all the questions at the end and get an email out to you with the answers, um, but I will try and have a look as I go along. So uh, just before I carry on, we're really happy to be sponsored by Wesley and The Next Step. They essentially help you to prepare for the transition to your first foundation year and beyond. They give advice on and support on career finances and well-being. Have a little scan of the QR code to find out some more information and you can follow them on um, Facebook and Instagram. Hope you can all hear me. Let me know if you can't. Um, let's meet the organisers again. So we've got Salmia and Balamrit, who um, are chair and co-chair of the Kiel Medical Education Society Committee. We've got Janice, who is the lead for the final year series. Um, and these three have essentially just done lots of work behind the scenes to get all these sessions organised for you, make sure things run smoothly. We've got Akash, who is the founder of Mind the Bleep, and we've got myself, who is the lead for prescribing for the PSA series. Just a quick um, disclaimer, the Prescribing Safety Assessment Series for Mind the Bleep has been created by junior doctors who have a passion for teaching entirely on a voluntary basis. The aim is to teach from experience and help to ease the anxieties around the exam. I've tried to make the lecture slides um, and the teaching content as accurate as possible um, and to the best of, of our knowledge. However, there might be some unintentional mistakes. So if there's anything, just point it out to us and we will get it amended quickly. There's a full list of T's and C's on this link. So today, as I said, we'll be doing the prescribing in medical emergencies. This should help a lot with the first section of the exam, um, with the prescribing section, but also there's some other sections like adverse drug reactions and the planning and managing uh, sections as well. That should come in handy. So hopefully this will be a helpful session. Next week on the 1st of December, I'll be going over calculation skills. So um, that will essentially cover the calculation part of the exam. So we've got lots of multiple choice questions on that as well. And then I'll let you read this in your own time. It's essentially all the other the sessions that we're going to be doing. The, on the 7th of December, I've got a colleague of mine who's going to be running the medicine and surgery section of the, the, the blueprint, um, and I'll be there to, to man the chat. Um, yeah, and our last session will be a Q&A on the 2nd of February. So if you've got any burning questions that you've not asked during the sessions, you can bring it to the, the Q&A, and as much of us, most of us, or whoever can make it, will make it for the session, and I'll make sure I'm there. This is the blueprint. I'm sure you've seen it lots of times. Um, have a look at it in your own time, but we're going to try and cover as much as we can of the blueprint. Structure of the session, uh, we will be covering common medical emergencies that I think we should be familiar at FY1 level and also most of the stuff that I mentioned on the, on the blueprint. Um, it will be a mixture of polls and chat-based answers. And um, I've tried to make lots of new questions because the feedback from before was not to recycle all of the or most of the, the the PSA paper so we've taken that on board and put some new questions with some new scenarios so hopefully that will be useful for you. So without further ado this is question one we've got a 14 year old girl playing in the park on a busy summer's day uh, she suddenly develops difficulty breathing swelling of the face and tongue she becomes pale and clammy and collapses to the floor she's not prepubertal and is of normal body weight prescribe one drug to be administered for the immediate management of this condition. So try and use um, your online BNF just to have a look at where you'd find the answers. And we have a poll. Let me know if you can or cannot see the poll. I'm hoping you can see it. I'll just give you a minute or so to have a look, maybe two minutes. That's cool. You can you can write it in the um in the chat, or you can write it in the if you can answer the poll. Let me know if you can't. This is the first time I've done the poll. Oh, I think it's working. I'll give you a bit more time. 
So we've got epigenetic. What strength would we use? So we've got EpiPen, 300 micrograms, epigenetic, 300 micrograms. Um, and we've got about 18 responses. So I'll wait just a little bit, a few more responses. I think there's about 40 of you here and then we'll, we'll go through the answer. 300 micrograms. OK, cool. I'll give it one more minute. Yeah, I'm wondering that too. I think it might be a, uh, I've not heard of it. I've heard of EpiPen. Um, it might just be a brand. Is it a branded EpiPen, Adrenaline or? Ah, okay. Any more answers? So we've got the majority of people going for 0.5 ml of the one in a thousand injection im and we've got a few iv um and 0.3 ml of one in a thousand no one's gone for the pyroton the chlorphenamine um cool okay i've got two of the same answers there cool so let's uh stop that poll i think that's stopped So if you, this is so small for me on my screen now, if you um, type in anaphylaxis, for example, if, if you're thinking it's anaphylaxis, um, you can find it through medical emergencies as well, a treatment summary. If you, if you um, type in anaphylaxis in the, in the BNF online and you click on treatment summary, you will see here it says medical emergencies in the community. This is what you want to click on. And then on the left hand side, you've got a list of the medical emergencies, you click on anaphylaxis and you've got all the doses there that you need. So it's all about knowing where to look, look in the BNF essentially. Some of you might know the doses off by heart, but if you don't, then this is how we find it. So we were told that she was 14, let me get the question back up, she's a 14 year old girl. Um, and I've specifically told you she's not prepubertal and she's of normal body weight. So if we put her in this category, 12 to 17, it's actually 500 micrograms or 0.5 ml. Um, that we give intramuscularly. So um, it'd be interesting to know why some of you went for the 0.3. Was it because you're thinking she's a child or um, that's quite interesting because quite, quite a few of you went for that. So yeah, basically follow follow the algorithm. She's of, she's not prepubertal and she's not sort of small. I've said she's of a normal body weight. So yeah, we'll go for the, the 0.5 ml. Some of you have gone for IV. Um, I don't know if that was sort of answering it quickly or or if you want to give it IV. We would never give this drug um, IV for uh, anaphylaxis. The one in 10,000 is given intravenously for cardiac arrest, but the one in 1,000 in anaphylaxis, we'll never, we wouldn't be given it IV. So I don't know if it was a typo, if you accidentally selected it or if you wanted it IV, but just be cautious of that in the exam you might accidentally choose IV in the drop down um, and you wouldn't get the marks for that because that's uh, it's, it's quite a high strength and it's dangerous to give it IV. So always IM for anaphylaxis. Excellent. Next question. Uh, we have a nurse looking after Jean. She's 78 years old and um, the nurse informs you that Jean appears to be more confused than usual. This morning is trembling and is slightly clammy. She appears cachectic and did not eat her breakfast. So these are quite inf important information in the question Question stem. She's type one diabetic. She's had a recent DVT and she's on these following medicines. So she's on some insulin and she's on a Pixaban five milligrams BD for her clot. The nurse kindly measures Jean's blood pressure, blood glucose, and uh, finger prick capillary glucose is two. Jean is not able to converse with you and you're concerned about her level of consciousness. How would you manage this condition? Prescribe one drug to manage it appropriately. So I've got another poll.
again think about where you're looking in the bnf and how to get the answer because everything is in the bnf and and read read the question stem really carefully and pick out the the important parts of it because everything that you're given is 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 relative is for the question relevant it's a good mixture of answers so far Um, no, she's got venous access if, if you want to give it IV. That's a very good question. She's in hospital, so we assume she's got she's got a cannula. But good question. And in the in the PSA, I would imagine they would, you know, they would mention that they've got venous access. There shouldn't be any ambiguity. The questions go through lots of different people, I would imagine, like our exams do as well, so that there aren't any ambiguities. So don't worry too much. Okay, excellent. Let's close that poll. So the majority of people have gone for glucagon IM, one mig IM, and then some of you have gone for the tablets. So I'm not sure if you can see the the, the poll, so I'm just reading it out. Um, so it's a, it's a good good spread of answers, but 33% of you went for the glucagon IM. So we'll, we'll discuss, um, did they give options in the PSA? So in the PSA, you'd have to type the, the drugs and doses. I'm just, I'm just trying to make this a bit more exciting for you guys, but you would have to, so you'd have to say, um, you'd have to start typing. So if you type glucagon, then it would come up and you'd select glucagon and then you'd write the dose one milligram, the root IM. But you have lots of options for the root. You can put anything you want. So you have to make sure you write um, you write IM. But I can't I can't make it like that for the polls, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, you would be prescribing it. If you wanted to prescribe glucose, you'd write glucose or dextrose 20 percent um, and then choose the whatever line that you want. Uh, and then you'd have to write it over a certain amount of time. You, if you want it IV, write it IV. Um, have a play around on the on the exam so that it's not alien to you when you're when you're doing it. The, the practice papers are really, really helpful online. All right, let's stop that one. So if you um, again, medical emergencies treatment summary, if you have a look at hypoglycemia is one of the one of the options there then it tells you everything you need to know um the aim of the treatment is to give 15 grams to 20 grams load of glucose of, of a carbohydrate now how you do that depends on how the patient is so in the in the question stem i said she's not you're you're concerned about her level of consciousness she's not being responsive to you so um some of you suggested giving the oral tablets that would be good if they were if if they had an incidental hypo but they were talking to you that would be great and you weren't concerned about their swallow but um, this patient doesn't sound like they'd be able to swallow, so it wouldn't be appropriate to give the, the tablets. Um, glucagon IM would be would be appropriate, especially if they don't have IV access. However, um, I'm just I've made these complex to sort of do some teaching as well. But um, the patient we said is cachectic, and in in patients, how do you specify twenty or fifty? Um, when you start typing it, it will come up with the different percentage strengths, and you can choose the the, the strength that you want. Um, ha have a go when you're typing it in the in the exam. In the name, yeah. So in the name, you would, when you start typing glucose, it will come up with the different percentages, and you'll choose the percent. And then in the dose, you'll say hundred ml 
or 75 ml and then in the time you'd say over 15 minutes if that makes sense um so glucagon im would be a great option but this patient is cachectic so the way glucagon works is you need to have glycogen reserves and if patients who are cachectic they they don't do um so it wouldn't actually work it wouldn't be effective so I'm I'm just trying to get you sort of thinking a bit more. So well done for choosing that. It's not it's it's incorrect in this instance, but I don't think the complex the question will be that complex in the exam. But just look out if they're cachexic and also in real life, you wouldn't want to give it um IM because it essentially wouldn't work. So um you want to give 15 to 20 grams. So you can give you can either go for the glucose 20% and you give 75 to 100 mil over 15 minutes, or you go for the glucose 10% and you give it 150 mil to 200 ml. We'll go over that. So um, I wanted to show you this because when when I was sort of prepping for the exam as well, I was worried thinking there's so many different combinations. Like, do they just want one one combination of time, volume and and strength of, of glucose? But if you have a look here, you can there's so many things you can put. And in fact, they accept anything from 10 to 20 grams glucose load, whereas the BNF actually says suggests to give 15 to 20 and the exam actually even accepts if you have a look here you can you can deliver up to 40 grams because they're saying it's better to give more than than less um so i wouldn't panic too much there's so many different combinations of of stuff that you can prescribe and still get full marks so i hope that eases a bit of anxiety around that because um yeah you don't you know you don't have to literally exactly put exactly what they want because there's lots of different options um the f over four hours will be wrong because it's too slow you want to give it over 15 minutes um you can even you can see here they accept 20 minutes as well so the bnf is a lot more strict than than what they want here do they give options let's see what other questions we've got um so if what if they were cachectic weren't in hospital didn't have a safe follow didn't have venous access i mean it's better to give something than nothing um but you would be rushing them straight to hospital and trying to get an iv line in you won't get anything like this for the for the psa exam but and that would be quite unfortunate if that happened in the community but um it will be better than nothing um but ideally you want iv access the the end goal would be to get iv access for them so um, just a quick thing as well. So um, I think we've essentially gone over this. You can give by mouth if they're conscious um, or you can give by buckle if they're still conscious but uncooperative. So they might not swallow the the, the tablets. Um, so I am glucagon is incorrect because the patient is cachexic, um, cachectic. And that basically means they're very, very low weight. So their glycogen stores are unlikely to, to be enough for the glucagon to work. That's why. Um, and if they're unresponsive, then you um, you can give the glycogen, but uh, glucagon. But we've just explained why we wouldn't in this case. And if you have a look at glucagon in the BNF in the cautions, there's lots of other things that you wouldn't give it in. So um, a glu glucagonoma, um, because I tried to Google this. I think because you've essentially got a tumor secreting glucagon, and then if you give the glucagon, you can end up getting a delayed hypo or something or high it's that one was a bit confusing but you wouldn't give it in this um and here you can see starvation adrenal insufficiency insulinoma um lots of things here so uh, starvation is that the patient was cachectic so essentially she's in a starvation state so that's why we wouldn't i wouldn't worry too much for the exam because it would be a lot more clear cut um i was just trying to cover a, few, a bit of teaching as well so next question we have got 72 year old bill with known dementia presents to amy with his daughter she reports he has not been himself when she telephoned him he was mumbling odd words and not making very much sense she says that he can normally get slightly confused and withdrawn um but this was very out of character he acted similarly last month following a uti and she's therefore concerned that he might have another one she's not sure what meds he's on um but she's brought some of them in with with her um so these are some of the tablets in in this chap's bag that he takes these are his results so let me just open the poll and then we can read the rest um there we go so his urine dip he was positive for nitrites positive for leukocytes blood ketones for random blood glucose was eight vbg 7.29 and he's tachycardic with a blood pressure of 89 over 60. he's also got some abdominal pain discomfort and he's not following your commands very well at all so ah, how would you manage this um condition yeah 
And what do we think, sort of, what do we think is going on? Can you see the poll? I'm not sure if you can, yeah. So we've got two responses. Does that mean lots of you are thinking about what's going on? Let me look at the messages. Oh, so IDDM is insulin dependent diabetes mellitus and NIDDM is non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. Thanks, Sarah. So is there anything to suggest this patient is on insulin or is not on insulin? What, what do we think is going on? Insulin and potassium. Yeah. What's the potassium reference for, Sarah? Sorry, guys, I'm trying to man the chat as well. So if it's a bit disjointed, apologies. Euglycemic ketoacidosis. Mm, well done, Kath. Amazing. So just for the purpose of time, because there's quite a few questions I wanted to cover as much as possible, I will stop the poll. Um, majority of you have gone for DK in NIDDM. That could be because I didn't clarify what the NIDDM and IDDM meant. Um, or it could be because we weren't sure what this inlet was, but that's what 44% have gone for that. And then we've got um, recurrence of UTI, and then we've got DK in an insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. So if we just go through the rationale, so it's not a recurrence of UTI. I can see why you guys um, thought it might be. Um, basically, a urine dip isn't that indicative of a UTI in some in, in elderly, in the elderly population. A lot of people can have um, positive leukocytes or nitrides and not have a, a urine infection. So in the elderly, they actually say not to dip the urine. If you're, you know, if they're symptomatic, you could you send the urine for culture and you can treat. But there's nothing in this question to suggest that they were they were symptomatic. So it's a bit of a red herring, but just also a good learning point. Um, sometimes they can they can test positive but not have a UTI, and the it wouldn't really explain the the elevated ketones and the 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 low low pH on the BBG. So um, it's not in a, it's, it is DK, but it's not in a, it's non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. If I just go back quickly, just to show you this, this is an inlet device and it's essentially used for people who um, who might have issues with their dexterity. If they've got maybe um, arthritis and, and deformities in their hands, it's sort of like, it's a device with a big dial. So they can also see the units bigger. They dial it to the units and then they press the green button. This bottom comes off and then they essentially inject themselves. So um, thought it was quite interesting. This is this is a different device because normally you see the insulin pen, so that's why it's insulin dependent. Um, constipation it can cause confusion, but we wouldn't say it's the most likely cause given the rest of the picture. Pain can cause tachycardia, but again, not the most likely cause. Um, so the correct answer is DK in an insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. So well done to those of you. It could be a worsening of dementia, but it wouldn't be that that acute, especially with all the other things going on. So just a quick thing on, on the DKA, the, the D element of DK is, is essentially being diabetic or having a blood sugar of um, greater than 11 millimoles. Um, but I've put an asterisk here because in not, not in all cases does your blood sugar have to be above 11 to be classed as DKA. The K is the ketone, so ketones greater than 3 in your blood or at least 2 plus in your urine. And then a VBG of a pH less than 7.3 or a bicarb and or, or a bicarb of less than 15. The most important thing to do is fluid resuscitate and reverse the metabolic disturbances. Well, these, yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna try and find a way to just put all the slides up for you guys as well, so you can have a look later. I'll do that, I'll try and do that by next week because other people have asked as well, um, so that you can 
access it later so don't worry about that that's okay so fluid resuscitate and reversal of metabolic disturbances i'm sure you've covered this in your sort of um in your teaching anyway so write one prescription and this is in the chat this isn't a poll um for one iv fluid that is the most appropriate for the initial management of this condition so if you know what it is you can prescribe it straight away or there is a way of finding it in the bnf so Try both um, and see what, what you would think. So I've just put the, his OBS again and some of the blood investigation results just to help you um, to decide what to do. So one, so the initial thing that you will do, obviously there's lots of things to do, um, but what's the initial thing? And this is something you, something common that you'll be asked to do to, to prescribe. And yeah, Kath, just to reiterate, well done on that one. So the um, the HDLT2 inhibitors can cause euglycemic decay. When I was working as a pharmacist, it wasn't as common. This was like quite a quite a while ago. Um, but now it's it's becoming more and more sort of picked up on and more more uh, um, more cases of it. So it's it's it could be something that could come up. We don't know what could come up, but it's actually it's a really important thing to know um, and to look out for because it's it's becoming more and more common. I guess the more people that are started on the drug. Um, the more likely they are to, to to present with with a euglycemic DKA, and I've got a little explanation later as to why that happens for those of you that aren't aren't aware. So, any ideas of what we prescribe? I'll give it one more minute. Great. So, have you? Nivida, sorry if I've pronounced that wrong. Have you have you found that in the BNF somewhere? Or yep, yeah, perfect. How quickly would we give it, Amna? And how much? Perfect. So I will um, go through this now. So if you type in, if, if you're thinking, oh, this is DKA, just type in DKA into the search bar. Um, and sorry, guys, I've done screenshots because um, I think it's better than switching between the screens still. So hopefully this is still helpful. Some of you yes, last time said to, to show you how to find these things, but I think it will slow the, the system down. So type in DKA, um, click on treatment summary and DKA comes up. Um, it's actually quicker to just type DKA than diabetic hyperglycemic emergencies. You might make a typo when you type the longer one. So um, this is how quick and easy it is to, to find in the BNF DKA treatment summary. And it's the only thing that comes up. If you scroll down to DKA, um, it, if you're not sure what the initial management is, you probably would have covered this in your lectures. But you would the first thing you do is fluid resuscitate, and essentially just says fluid replacement. So um, it's a it's a mixture of acquired knowledge as well. But we we use resuscitate with sodium chloride um, in in DKA. So you can go to the um, you can go to the sodium chloride. And then you, there's actually a section for DKA and it says if if a systolic blood pressure is below 90, which it was for this patient, this is what you give. Um, I personally don't think they're going to ask you to prescribe, you know, because with, with DKA, you, you give the resuscitation and then depending on the blood pressure, you'll give a litre over an hour, then a litre over two hours, then a litre over four hours. It's, there's a protocol to follow. And I don't, I think it's too complex to be asked any more than this, basically. And this is essentially fluid resuscitation. So you could have a, a septic patient, a question based on a, uh, a patient who's septic, and it's essentially the same thing. You'll give 500 mils over 15 minutes. Um, I'm not sure, Kath. Um, however, I think, I think I have tried to type, I don't think there's an option for a fixed rate. Um, or sliding scale stuff on on the PSA exam because I think that would get a bit too complex. So I I don't know personally, but I don't think you you would. And if you if you try some combinations in the prescribing section, I don't think the fixed rate stuff comes up. Um, yeah, no, <laughs> I I hope not too because it's actually really complex even now when we're when we're we're prescribing in the hospital. So um, I I really don't think they would expect that. But fluid resuscitate as a you know. When you're attending to an emergency or someone's septic, then knowing to prescribe 
to fluid resuscitate, give 500 mils over 15 minutes, that's great. And that's being a safe F1. Um, all the other stuff, you're following protocols. And yeah, I just, I, I don't know, don't hold me to it, but I don't think they'd be asking you to do more complex things. I hope not. <laughs> Um, okie dokie. So just a quick thing on HGLT2 inhibitors. So like this, the Forxiga was dapagliflozin. Um, it inhibits the sodium glucose co-transporter in the PCT of the nephron. And essentially what that means is instead of um, instead of keeping the glucose and sodium in, you end up peeing the glucose out. So um, you might be in DKA, but you won't have the elevated glucose levels in the bloodstream because you're weeing it out. So it's really interesting in that sense. But um, one of the common side effects of the DKAs is UTIs because you're concentrating all this glucose and it's a good feeding ground for bacteria. So it's quite interesting to know. Insulin prescribing, one quick thing on this. Um, when you're prescribing, you have to write the words unit or international units out in full. You cannot abbreviate it. And this is even stated in the BNF. It's a never event if if there's if any harm comes to a patient and um, because you've not written unit or international units in full. So it's just just make sure you write it out in full when you're prescribing. Uh, you should the device should be specified so if it's a vial cartridge, flex pen, inlet, um, or and the strength as well. So didn't used to be a problem before when there was just 100 units per mil, but now there's 200 units, 300 units, 500 units per mil. So always specify the units per mil as well and the units of the dose that you want and also the brand to make sure the patient is maintained on the same brand, um, especially when they get discharged. If they're sent home on a different pen and they don't know how to use it, that could be dangerous. And if we're trying to get an idea of never events in regards to not prescribing with the full word in units, for example, I think if you have the wrong leg amputated or if you if somebody's if you pull out the wrong tooth or if you put a central line in on the wrong patient things like that those are all never events so it's quite quite serious um so yeah write the words in units this is an actual example of of people's sort of prescriptions um from the i've got it from a bmj article so it's really uh you know 60 here it could be 60 units or 6u um, and 60 units isn't unreasonable to give to some patients. I've seen those doses in sort of patients who are insulin resistant or quite overweight. Um, but if somebody was quite insulin night, you know, if they just started on insulin, you'd give them 60 units, you could put them into a coma. Um, so yeah, I thought that this is just quite scary, really. This could be misread as 100 units, for example. So write the units in full. Question six. Um, let me see if I've got the poll here before I read it for you. Here we go. So 48 year old male commenced on clarithromycin and amoxicillin for a cap. He's got a past medical history of AF and rheumatoid arthritis and he's on warfarin um, and some PR and paracetamol for pain. These are his examination findings and OBS um, and his investigations. So I'll let you I'll let you have a look at all those. I've put I've put the ranges in there and you will be given the ranges in the um, in the exam. You should be given them because different labs use different ranges. So you're not expected to um, remember them. And don't don't try and be fixed with the ranges that, you know, from your trust, because actually what it might be normal for you, the num the value that you think is normal from your for your trust might be different to the range they give you. That's normal. So make sure you just use their ranges that they've given you. And things to look out for here, the, the INR, his HP is normal, INR is above the range, quite a bit above the range, um, his kidneys are doing okay, uh, and there's no signs of bleeding, so that's quite relevant to when you decide how to manage this condition. And again, this could be in the prescribing, but this could also be in the management section of the exam, so it's quite useful to know. Warfarin's quite an important drug as well.
Um, so, so it doesn't say in the treatment summary. In the treatment summary, it says the mainstay of treatment initially is to fluid resuscitate. So um, I haven't found exactly where it says to give the 500 ml saline in the treatment summary, but we fluid resuscitate normally with 500 ml saline. And any most protocols that I've seen for DKA, they use um, they use saline. So it's kind of a bit of acquired knowledge as well. And then when you go on to just the the drug uh, monograph for normal saline, you scroll down and there's actually a bit for DKA. Um, what to prescribe in, in DKA. And it's on the slides. I've, I've put a, um, a picture of it on the slide, the drug monograph. So you'll see it literally, it's, it literally says in DKA, if the systolic blood pressure is less than 90, then you prescribe 500 mils over 15. That's all right. Give it one more minute. I love how spread the questions are this the answers are this is great at the moment it's between um vitamin k iv or vitamin k oral Super. So let me close the poll. Um, and thanks so much for participating, guys. It always makes it more fun when when you guys have a go. Um, so we have some dried prothrombin complex answers. Um, and then one, a few inoxaparin, quite a few actually, um, subcut once daily. So those of you who chose inoxaparin, um, I'd be really interested to know why, uh, just to kind of understand the way you approach the question, and then we can go through why that's not the answer. But um, it's not, it's not a, I wish there was an, an anonymous, anonymous way to do this chat so you didn't feel singled out. It's more, it's more of a learning experience, sort of why you, why you thought that as an answer. It might be the way I've quite worded the question. So it'd be interesting to know what your sort of approach was to the question. If you don't mind um, popping it in the chat, if not, that's fine. Um, and then, yep, yeah, and then some of us went for IV vitamin K and some went for oral stat. So um, if we type in oral anticoagulants um, in, in the search bar, um, that's the treatment summary that, that we want. Um, and then you scroll down on the left, you choose vitamin K antagonists, and it essentially has everything you need to know here. So it's in the all anticoagulants treatment summaries under bleeding, if, if you're bleeding. So um, in the question, we are told that the INR is over eight. So we go here, um, INR greater than eight. So we've got two options here. It says minor bleeding, no bleeding. Um, in the question stem, I said there was no bleeding and his HP was, was 114. Um, in acute bleeding, sometimes the HP doesn't change, but I think if, if the patient was in this kind of scenario in an exam, they probably would say, oh, it's like 70, just to also draw your attention that the patient's bleeding. But this patient is not bleeding and we've said that they're not bleeding. Um, so we would essentially just use this one. So it's INR over eight, not bleeding. It says stop the warfarin, give phytomenodione. So you give the um, injection orally. So you give the intravenous preparation orally. Um, and then, so this is what you need to do. So then you click on phytomenodione. I think I've got another um and then you scroll down and again it's here as well it says if it's over eight no bleeding then you give one to five migs i've just gone with what did i go with two um if it's a range then i think we've seen how lenient they are with the fluids and stuff if you gave five it's your judgment if you gave one or two three or four i can't see why any of those would be would be wrong because you followed the you followed the um the protocol here so um inoxaparin so if somebody was bleeding, um, inoxaparin, you'd actually, you, if they were on inoxaparin, you'd actually stop inoxaparin. Or if they've come in with the bleed, then you wouldn't give them any sort of any uh, VT prophylaxis. This is actually a treatment dose, so for like PE or things like that. So um, it's just interesting to know why why we went for that one. Um, but just as an educational thing, we wouldn't, we absolutely, we wouldn't prescribe inoxaparin just because it would 
potentially it would make the bleeding worse. Um, so that would be something we would stop. So you might have this in the in the, the uh, not the prescribing section, but it might be you know which drugs are inappropriate. You might have to tick some things. So if somebody is bleeding, we wouldn't give an oxaparin. Um, dried prothrombin is an option. Um, but you, that would be if someone's heavily bleeding and you would consult the haematologist on, on sort of how much to give and what to do, really. I know there is an option on one of the PSA papers, but I don't think it's in the prescribing section and they are bleeding and it's one of the answer options and it's correct. But in this instance, because they're not bleeding, we wouldn't need to do that. Um, some of you went for vitamin K5 mix IV stat. Uh, I mean, if you... If you gave it, I don't think any harm would come to the patient necessarily. However, they're not bleeding and um, it wouldn't be correct because because they're not bleeding. You'd follow this one and you'd give it you'd give it orally. Uh, Tranexamic acid is given in bleeding, but specifically with INR and the warfarin, we use we use the uh, the vitamin K. Next question. Uh, let me open the poll again. You'll be pleased to know this is the final one, I think, guys. So let's start. Um, you've got a 36-year-old female um, presents to the emergency department, vomiting and feeling generally unwell. Her past medical history, myasthenia gravis, eczema, asthma. She's on prednisolone 60 mg daily, salbutamol inhaler as and when required, and, and an emollient for her eczema. On assessment, she's nauseous, she's still vomiting, she's got abdo pain, and she's got a, a fever. Her investigations show a low sodium, elevated potassium, uh, elevated corrected calcium, and a blood pressure of 96 over 70. Um, prescribe one drug for the immediate management of this condition prior to assessment. Further assessment. Now, this 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 would be a great question to ask in the prescribing. I don't know if it has been in the past, but um, I think it's an important thing to know and to recognise. How would you know which dose to give? So it doesn't matter. Um, I don't think so. I went on two mix. I just picked the range um, for the for the vitamin K. Um, as I was saying, the when you have a look at the fluids, there's so many different volumes over a different, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, you get all the marks um, for the for the hypo question, if you have a look back on the slides. So if you're given a range, I can't imagine that you would get, you would, they, you wouldn't have to just, there wouldn't be one correct answer. I think if you gave one all the way up to five, it can't be wrong because you've, you're given the range, if you see what I mean. And just like with a hypo question, the BNF wants you to give between 15 and 20 grams um, of a glucose load and actually the PSA exam would were happy to accept between 10 and 20 and were even happy to accept if you gave 40 grams which is obviously more than the BNF suggests but it's more of a you know we need to get the drug in it's not you're just giving them a bit more glucose um, but at least it's managing the, the hypo so I think I hope that shows that you can there's lots of different combinations of things that you can you can prescribe. So I think one, two, three, four, or five MIGs, you should get all the marks because you're not how you, nobody knows whether to give what to give. You just kind of just give it and see see how how it goes, and then you can obviously give more later. I'll just give it one more minute. And the, the, the again, it's great. There's a great spread of answers with one sort of 50% uh, of you have gone for one particularly, but then there's a spread of the other ones. Um, the, the question is for the immediate management. So, so you have to really, really sort of read the question closely and just think what's what's the most sort of important thing that you need to manage straight away um in hospital you'd probably prescribe most of these things in combination you know you'd want to you'd want to control the nausea you'd want to control the other issues um but it's kind of you can't prescribe all things at once so it's the most important thing at that time that you need to address shiny Okay, I think I'll stop the poll. Um, thank you for all of those that have had a go. Wonderful. So um, we've got 20% of you went for metoclopramide 10mg 
um, IV, some have gone for cyclozine. We've got 40, oh, it's changing. Oh, cool, we're still answering. I don't know, no, don't know. cool. Um, some have gone for PRED 60 oral stat, and some have gone for hydrocortisone 60 mg IV stat. So this is great, great to see such a spread of answers. So the answer, um, how to find the answer, let's start with that. The answer is hydrocortisone 100 mg IV stat. So well done to those of you who, who've gone for that. Um, if you type in, so essentially what's going on here is adrenal insufficiency. And this is a really, really like important thing to pick up on if you can. It's a you know, you'd be like, wow, well done. Um, if someone comes into A&E or um, they might actually deteriorate on the ward. So if somebody, ha somebody or if someone's on long term steroids and they become acutely unwell or maybe they've missed their doses, we don't know what's going on. But if they're on long term steroids, their their own production of steroids are suppressed. Um, and essentially what happens is you have low sodium. This is this is classic for adrenal insufficiency. You have low sodium, elevated potassium. And the calcium can also be elevated and the blood pressure is low. And this is because you haven't got the, the sort of the steroid, the hormones, the steroid hormones in your own, your own body is not producing them. Um, so you, I imagine you'd cover this in your medical stuff anyway, your, your lectures. But in terms of prescribing, um, if we type in adrenal insufficiency, treatment summary, um, scroll down, aims of treatment, essentially you need to... Um, you need to replace the glucocorticoid and it's saying mainly the hydrocortisone you need to replace. So click on the hydrocortisone um, and essentially scroll down indications and dose. Adrenal crisis in patients with adrenal insufficiency who are on steroid dependent. So this patient is on 60 mg of steroid for the myasthenes gravis. Um, so this is the, what we'd go for. So initially you give 100 milligrams IV. Um, and then afterwards, you'd be given, you'd have to give 200 milligrams every 24 hours. So uh, most of the time, you just give 50 mg every six hours, um, four times a day, essentially. And you can, yeah, make it's essentially just do it every six hours, 50 mg. Uh, yeah, basically. Well, there's some alternatives as well that they suggest. But the first thing you give 100 mg IV um, hydrocortisone. So I hope that's helpful because that's, again, I don't know if it could come up, but it's a really important one and it's quite easy to find in the quite easy to find in the in the BNF. So well done, guys. Um, what else? Metoclopramide isn't wrong. Um, but the most the, the most sort of dangerous thing is the this adrenal insufficiency. So you'd you would prescribe an antiemetic as well. Um, but it's not the first thing, the most pressing thing. Um, hydrocortisone 60 mg IV start. I can see why some of you have gone for that because they were on 60 mg, but we go for a hundred. Um, if they if they weren't on pred off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but it's it's just a bit further up to this this bit. It, it says um, who was who are uh, not steroid dependent. There's another bit sort of up here. <laughs> I'm not sure off the top of my head, guys. So um, have a look in the treatment summary, and it will be a bit further up. It will say if they are or aren't on steroids, or it should do. If not, drop me a question, drop me an email, and I will explain further. But I'm pretty sure it's in here. I've just screenshotted this little bit because they were on steroids in the question stem um so i haven't got any more any more sort of question based format questions for you guys but i think just some other things to be aware of i'm sure you guys already know just to cover in your own learning is um, asthma exacerbation this can come up across all the different sections of the prescribing it of the exam um and a good way to remember it i don't know you i'm sure you guys are familiar with oh shit me um oxygen so you want the target sats 94 to 98 percent um, salbutamol 2.5 to 5 migs the bnf says 5 migs but more recently there's sort of they've said there's not much difference between two and a half and five migs you're just exposing people to more side effects but if you're not sure in the exam like it's just best to go with what the BNF says. So just give five mix and you can give that back to back. You'd give a hyd hydrocortisone 100 mix IV if they're not um, able to take PRED by mouth. Otherwise, you can give PRED 40 mix by mouth daily. Um, and then you can give ip iprotropium nebulizers uh, every four to six hours. If they're really, really poorly, then you'd up upscale the treatment to theophylline, uh, aminophylline IV. Um, and we're going to go through an example of how to prescribe aminophylline IV um, in my next session because it's it's quite confusing um or i found it confusing magnesium is the next step but you would be escalating to senior as an f1 
probably before you even gave aminophilin. So, um, but I think you could easily be asked how to prescribe, I would imagine, in the exam. So we'll go through that. Quick thing about ABGs, um, essentially, they they end up having a type one um, respiratory failure. So they're, um, and basically, so their oxygen will be low, but their, their carbon dioxide, their oxygen will be low in carbon dioxide. Um, while they're able to compensate, they'll be breathing it out. But when the carbon dioxide starts normalizing, that's when you get very concerned because um, they're getting very, very ill. So I, you're not going to have, I don't think you have any ABG interpretations in the exam, but it's a really interesting thing to know. If, if you have any patients on the wards with asthma exacerbations, have a look at the ABGs and have a look at the trend. If the carbon dioxide is normalizing, that's a bad sign and you'll be escalating to ITU um, because they're no longer able to breathe off the carbon dioxide, so they're tiring. Um, there's a treatment summary for the acute exacerbation of asthma and it's super, super helpful. It classifies the different types because there's life-threatening, severe, there's lots of different types um, and there's a good treatment sort of summary of what, you, what you'd give and how you'd manage it. So that's really, really helpful. Have a look at it, work your way around it, make sure you know what's what's there because it will help, help in the exam. ACS as well, just a quick one on there. Um, type in acute coronary syndrome. It's a treatment summary. Have a look at the management for it. There's a mnemonic here I'm sure you're all aware of, um, of Mona. The oxygen nowadays, um, you don't give it initially, and I think it says it here as well, um, should not be routinely administered. If they're sat to below 94%, then you just treat it as the normal sort of low oxygen, you'd give oxygen, but otherwise you wouldn't routinely give oxygen to somebody. We learn in our simulations and stuff, you know, if someone's acutely unwell, you just put them on 15 litres non-rebreathe. In, in ACS, if their saturations are actually normal, then you don't need to give the oxygen have a look at the treatment summary. If you have any questions with the drugs, email me, but um, it's quite straightforward in there. Um, paracetamol, OD, um, there's a poisoning emergency treatment treatment summary. Have a look in there. It's not just paracetamol. It's got lots of other, other sort of uh, drugs and, and poisoning and stuff to have a look at. This will be useful in some of the other sections of the, the exam as well, I imagine. Um, there's a really helpful table in the for the paracetamol overdose for the volume of acetylcysteine to give the different bags of infusions and how much to give based on weight. Just it's useful to know where it is um, and, and sort of how to navigate it. So have a look there. I think um, in the medical emergencies section in the community as well as the treatment summary, um, have a look at just the emergencies in the community. Hyperglycemia, we've gone through anaphylaxis, we've gone through ACS, we've, I've shown you um, bacterial infections, so things like meningi meningitis, you could have a child who is suspecting to have meningitis, seizures is, is, is a good one to have a look at, um, and then obstructive airway disease we've had a look at. So have a look at all of these, um, make sure you're familiar with them because they'll be super helpful for, for the exam. Um, that's about it from me.